Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever you're watching this. Um, first, I apologize for this being late. Uh, having to go out of town this weekend kind of messed everything up and honestly didn't feel that great when I got home yesterday. So I wanted to go ahead and do this fresh today. So we'll just kind of push everything a day. Um, just, you know, get the discussion board done by Sunday. It'd be great. Um, so... Uh, what today's topic is, is one of my favorites, actually. It's imperialism. And we'll kind of go through the beginnings of American imperialism. I'll actually have a couple of John Oliver videos for you, which are quite humorous. And we'll kind of talk to you, tell you about our uh, territories then versus now. Well, then versus five, six years ago. Um, so oh, when we talked about the industrial age and the gilded age we talked about the emergence of international businesses and that's really what's going to drive imperialism is the desire to kind of go out and increase america's share of the profits in the world market so first thing to note is um Imperialism is nothing new. We obviously started as an imperial colony of uh, Great Britain. Um, but Europe had been in the imperial game for centuries in Africa and Asia and North America and South America. And we're really very, very late to this party. Um, there had been kind of a desire in this country oh, excuse me, uh, going back to George Washington to not get entangled in foreign affairs. Well, as our business interests increase, that becomes less and less likely. And so the first place that we're going to get involved will actually be Cuba. Cuba at the time was under Spanish rule. Uh, Spain had become kind of an imperial power starting about 1800. Um Spain is kind of interesting. It, you know, starts out as a great world power in 1600. Um, really, I guess they controlled Cuba before 1800. But um, they're really kind of one of the first to get out there. And they kind of hit their apex, and then they'd been in decline uh, pretty much since then. In fact, by, the, by this point that we're getting involved in Cuba, um, Spain really isn't a great power anymore. Uh, Spain is more of a um, second or third rate power. So what's going on in Cuba in the late 1800s? Well, Cubans, a lot of Cubans were not enjoying Spanish rule. And so from time to time, there would be an uprising. And usually the Spanish would come in and they would put down that uprising, but by the late 1800s, they really were having a problem with, one, they didn't really have any money. They'd actually run their treasury out of money twice. Um, and one time when they came over to put down this rebellion, they suffered from malaria. So what's happening over time is rebels are getting more and more bold. They want more and more independence at the same time. Uh, they are increasing their commercial ties with the United States. There's a lot of U.S. investment in Cuba. And so they're very much appealing to their American friends to really kind of help them out. So um, so what ultimately happens, um, let me make sure I got these in the right order, Uh <laughs> There we go. Okay, I do. Um, so basically what happens is Spain offers the rebels um, limited rule, limited self-rule, saying, okay, we'll give you some autonomy. Well, for those who wanted the Spanish off of their necks, that was not good enough. Um for those who were loyal to Spain, they said, man, you can't give in to these rebels. They'll keep getting more and more. Well, while all this is going on, we, you know, we are more and more involved. This is the time of yellow journalism. 
uh, Yellow Journalism, uh, Joseph Pulitzer, and um, uh, Hearst. Um, you know, Joseph Pulitzer starts Yellow Journalism, which was this desire to sell newspapers by telling outrageous, even sometimes false stories. Uh, it is the original fake news. In fact, in fact, here's an extra credit for you. You can either find a political cartoon about imperialism and explain what it is, or you can find an example of yellow journalism and explain why it's yellow journalism. So, so what's going on is Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst in New York, they're the ones competing in yellow journalism, and the term yellow journalism comes from a character called the Yellow Kid. I'll show you that in a supplemental th uh, document. Um, very racist caricature. Um, began to print stories about Spanish atrocities in Cuba. And really wasn't quite that simple. Uh, what rebels would do is they would actually go and burn farms that were tied to the Spanish government while leaving American owned uh, farms alone. Um, so the temperature is rising in the late 1890s. And McKinley, who is the president of the United States, he's elected in 1896. Um, this is why I like to do the progressive era first, because we're actually going to start with that election. Um, decides that the best way to restore calm and to take the temperature down was to send the U.S. battleship, the USS Maine, uh, to the Cuban harbor. Um, and that, that would cause people to calm down, because, you know, nothing is more soothing than a big-ass warship. So while McKinley is very much trying to avoid war because he was really our last leader who had fought in the Civil War, so he understood how awful war was and that it should be avoided, um, other events, yellow journalism and other events, will conspire to get the United States into this war. First, William uh, Hearst will uh, publish a private letter from the Spanish ambassador back to Spain that called McKinley, quote, weak and a bitter for the admiration of the crowd. Now, this outraised the public. It wasn't really that much of an insult. But in fact, Democratic newspapers probably call him a whole heck of a lot worse but it's kind of one of those things, like if you got like a little brother or sister, you can call them names, but no one else should. And that's how we felt about the president. So this outraged the uh, public. Still, McKinley is very much trying to tamp things down. Well, soon after that, the USS Maine exploded. Uh, yellow journalists uh, blamed the Spanish, even though they probably didn't do it. It probably was a maintenance thing. Uh, there are all kinds of conspiracy theories about the um, destruction of the Maine. McKinley, for his part, will still try diplomacy. Uh, many Americans, including the then Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Theodore Teddy Roosevelt, wanted to go to war. He wanted the excitement of war. He is a young man. He does not understand the horrors of war. Democrats champion war. Republicans thought that McKinley's reluctance to fight would hurt them at the polls. It's all about politics. Uh, some senators pushed Congress to actually declare war with or without McKinley. Now, that would have been a very kind of strange situation, right? Under our Constitution, the president is the commander-in-chief of the armed forces, but it's Congress who declares war. So what happens if you declare war without the uh, commander-in-chief on board? Well, fortunately, we did not find out. Uh, meanwhile, Senator Redfield Proctor gave a, an account of the Cuban situation and convinced many that there was a humanitarian reason to go and save Cuba. Spain will make one last offer of more autonomy for Cuba, this was not enough for McKinley, and McKinley asked Congress to authorize 
Um, excuse me. Let me let me back up just a little bit. Got things a little bit out of order. Um, now, before we get to the actual fighting, and I apologize. Uh, one thing that this, you know, that we learn from Redfield Proctor and others is that uh, the Spanish government, uh, under a general named Whaler, began to herd people into camps and destroyed their farms. This was called reconcentration. Uh, One hundred thousand Cubans were actually killed. Uh, Americans saw this as uncivilized and illegal. Uh, the Yellow Press reported more and more sensationalized stories from Cuba. Uh, to kind of talk about yellow journalism a little bit, it begins in the 1800s with Joseph Pulitzer. Uh, he used melodramatic, partly fictitious uh, stories in his newspapers, The New York World. Uh, William Randolph Hearst took over the New York Journal in 1895 and began doing the same thing, so it takes two to tango. Uh, the papers competed over who could tell the most sensational Cuban stories. They wrote about many atrocity stories. Some were not true. Uh, they helped the public visualize the brutality of the Spanish. In fact, Hearst actually sent an artist to Cuba uh, in order to be there to draw pictures about the fighting. Um, there's a, probably an apocryphal story that says the artist wrote Hearst back and said, I don't think anything's going to happen here. Can I come home? And Hearst supposedly replied to him, quote, you furnish the pictures and I will furnish the war. Meaning that he would make sure to conspire that the war would actually take place. Um, that may be apocryphal, may not be exactly true, but it kind of shows the mindset of yellow journalism. So McKinley, as I said, first tried to use diplomacy. In 1897, the Spanish actually did read their in their reconcentration um, policy and allowed the peasants to go back to their burnt out farms um, and did announce a plan for limited Cuban self-government. This led to, as I mentioned before, conflict, uh, um, protests from both sides. Uh, those who wanted it, those who wanted to be free wanted total and complete freedom, while those who supported Spain said that's just not enough. So finally, after the main explodes, and we talked about, you know, how everybody wants to go to war, but McKinley, but finally, uh, McKinley says, he asked Congress for a declaration uh, to fight without, uh, you know, authorization of, authorization of force um, to fight the Spanish in Cuba without declaring war. So Congress authorized force on April 24th, 1898. Spain then declared war on the United States. Congress then put out a declaration of war backdating it to April 21st, so we could say we did it first. Uh, we said that we were being altruistic. We even passed the Teller Amendment promising we would not annex Cuba. Uh, the war will last from April to August of 1898. It's a very short war. As I said, Spain was in decline. Um, this will lead to U.S. territorial expansion. One week into the war, Commodore George Dewey took a fleet to the Manila Harbor in the Philippines. You might think, wow, that doesn't make any sense. But he destroyed a, the Spanish Pacific fleet so that they could not reinforce Cuba. So it was actually a very smart tactical decision. Uh, while they were there, Dewey learned that the Filipinos were in the middle of their own revolt against Spain. At first, they um, welcomed the U.S. help. Their leader, Aquinado, said, I read the Constitution, and, you know, they don't, the United States doesn't take territory. Um, let me tell you how well that worked out. The next war we're going to talk about is called the Philippine-American War. Um, we also will use the fog of war to settle the Hawaii question. See, American interests have been in Hawaii for a while, 
And the leader of Hawaii, we call her Queen Lily. I'm not going to try to pronounce her full name because I can't. Uh, the Navy established a naval base at Pearl Harbor. Uh, as more and more American business interests entered into Hawaii, uh, they felt like they weren't getting treated correctly. So uh, with the U- help of the U.S. military, uh, they staged a coup in 1891 and immediately asked Congress to annex Hawaii. Well, in 1893... It comes before Congress. Congress refuses to annex Hawaii because of the controversy and uh, basically overthrowing the queen for no good reason. In 1892, or excuse me, in 1897, Congress again voted down annexation. Finally, in 1898, they changed their mind while during the conflict with Spain. And we assumed control of uh, Hawaii on July 7th, 1898. So that's how we got Hawaii. Uh, It was annexed through a joint resolution of Congress. We appointed a territory legislature and in 1900 gave them the right to form their own territorial legislature. So, here we are. We're at war. America's peacetime army was small and unprepared prepared. Teddy Roosevelt will resign his government foe post and form the U.S. First, Cal- First Volunteer Cavalry, known as the Rough Riders. They're kind of the face of the war. Uh, the armed forces will rise from 28,000 to 275,000 members. However, because of the short duration of the war, most of them will not leave the country. On June 22, 17,000 U.S. troops landed in Cuba began a slow march through the jungles to Santiago, had to deal with uh, hidden sharpshooters, made their way to San Juan Hill, which is kind of the, uh, if you know anything about the war, that's kind of the turning point of the war for us. On July 1st, Americans under General William Shafter attacked 750 Spanish soldiers. The Battle of San Juan Hill is the symbol of the war. The Rough Riders and the and African-American troops of the 9th and 10th Cavalry took the hill. Uh, The African-American troops did not get the credit they deserved. The Yellow Press published false stories about Spanish mutilation of American corpses corpses uh, fed into the notion of white supremacy. Um, We were able to take the hill due to the new Gatling machine gun, and then we decided to lay siege to the city of Santiago. The Spanish Navy tried to leave on July 3rd. American ships destroyed the fleet. On July 17th, the Spanish surrendered the city. Soon, U.S. forces arrived in Puerto Rico. They fought another battle on August 13th to take uh, Manila in the Philippines, even though the war had technically ended the day before. Many Americans in this war will die from malaria. The Surgeon General actually turned to female nurses to work uh, with the military. 1,500 nurses worked with uh, Army doctors at home and abroad. Uh, 385 Americans were killed in combat. 2,000 died from disease. The Peace Treaty on December 10, 1898, the Treaty of Paris, another one of those. Uh, Spain gave up its claim to Cuba. The U.S. received Puerto Rico and Guam and gave Spain $20 million, I guess, for Guam and Puerto Rico. Uh, The Philippines was also ceded to the United States. We now had to determine what to do with how to deal with the Philippines. Uh, Cuba will be independent but controlled by the United States. The Platt Amendment passed in 1901 said Cuba had to give us a military base. That's Guantanamo Bay. We still have it now. It is controversial. The U.S. was now allowed to intervene militarily if we found it necessary in Cuba. Cuba could not sign other treaties without the permission of the United States. Uh, We will uh, repeal the Platt Amendment in 1924. Uh, McKinley will win re-election in 1900 with Roosevelt as his running mate. They ran on American power and prosperity. And we see the beginnings of the United, the American Empire. The Senate approves the Treaty of Paris by 10 votes, and we began to vote 
on what to do about the Philippines, whether or not we should annex them. However, um, that will become moot because the Filipinos will rebel against American rule. Uh, some, like William Jennings Bryan, actually wanted uh, urged anti-imperialist Democrats to support the treaty uh, so that we could free the Philippines. Uh, Republicans wanted to keep the Philippines as a colony, seeing the Philippines as the great way to commerce in Asia. I'll explain that here in a minute. Uh, many were concerned that this uh, that there really was not a market for American goods in Asia, but you know here we are. Uh, many questions uh, many began to question whether or not the Filipinos could actually govern themselves. Uh, McKinley said we should uh, take over so we can civilize them. We wanted to he wanted to Christianize them, even though the Filipinos were mostly. Um, Catholic. After all, they've been under Spanish rule for a long time. Others thought that subjugating the Philippines was unconstitutional. From 1900 to 1904, the Supreme Court upheld the government's right to govern the Philippines, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico. Many saw this as Roger Kipling's, uh, as Roger Kipling's called it, America fulfilling the white man's burden. Uh, that's a good place to stop this first video. Next, we'll talk about the American-Filipino uh, uh, conflict.